All right, hopefully we've all loaded our data and turned NDVI into a time series object. And now why don't we all plot our NDVI time series object. Let's label equal here. I label equal greenness. Name equal NDVI. Run that. Oops, and let's add that mean line for data. So obviously there's some big differences between white noise data set, which is here, and the NDBI data set, which is here. And so let's think for a moment about what are some of the things that make a biological data set really different from how a randomly generated time series like the white noise is generated. A good starting point is to think about what we learned about NDVI from last week. So one of the big things we learned about NDVI is that there's this really strong seasonal signal in our data. And of course, one of the things about seasonality is that you have series of months that have uh, very similar values. And if we look at the NDVI signal here, well, we can start to see that where we have a month here that's really high, but then the months on either side, and it's hard to see because we don't have the data points, but the months on either side are also going to be elevated above the mean. Um, this is not a system that goes from bare dirt, peak greenness to bare dirt in single month steps. What you have is this relationship between adjacent time points so that they share kind of a, a, common, a, a common value or an elevated state together. And that is one of the key things that is missing from, of course, the random draw. And that's why you get this very sharp going back and forth, back and forth across the mean. Because in the random draw, what you can get very much is going from bare dirt to peak greenness to bare dirt all in three time steps. But one of the things this means for a biological data set is that our time points aren't independent. Um, so in a random draw, each one of those time points is independent. The value at time t does not depend on the value that, that came in the time step before. But in biology, often our value at time t has some relationship, is a function of some sort of any a value that came in the period time period before. So if we think about populations, the number of individuals in our population in our last measurement is likely to have ha be having influence or determine how many individuals we'll see in our next time step, just like we see with our greenness index. One of the things that we can do is use something called a lag plot to figure out how many different time steps can you see this dependence between the observation at one time point and the observation at another time point. So, so this concept of autocorrelation and lags can be very confusing for people who haven't been exposed to these concepts before. So I wanted to go back to the whiteboard real quick before we did further exploration of this in R, just to make sure that we're all clear on, on what these concepts are. So this idea of a lag is probably best described by thinking about, once again, a focal observation, and we'll pick this one for fun, and how many time steps in the past you want to look at a correlation. For a lag of one, you have your focal observation, and then you're comparing it to the value one month before. And if we make what's called a lag plot, what we're doing is we're doing this for every observation in our time series. We're taking each one of these observations and trying to compare it to what was happening one month before or T minus one. From that, we create a graph called a, a lag plot where we can look at the correlation or the relationship between the value at time T and the value at time t minus one. And we'll take those and we put them on this graph. And once we put all of them on this graph, what we can do is look at whether there's a strong correlation between what those values are. We could scale this up to longer lags. And so for example, if we wanted to do a lag of two, what we would be doing is saying, I'm actually interested in 
the relationship between the value at time t and the value at time t minus 2. And we can do this going further and further and further and back in time. And again, we do this with all of our data points. And then we plot those values of time t versus the value now at t minus 2. Our expectation, of course, is that the further we go back in time, the less correlation we should be seeing between what's happening at any, t any observation that we pick and something that happened in the past. This correlation between data points within your time series is called autocorrelation. So why don't we do that and explore that with that with our NDVI data and see what it gives us. So I am going to use a function called lagplot and base R. So we don't need to tag it with any libraries. We're going to give it our NDVI time series object. I'm going to tell it I want to do up to a 12 month lag, which means we'll be looking at lags one month, two months, three months, four months. I'm going to tell it do lines equal false. That's just to suppress some stuff that would be kind of confusing to us right now. So over in the plot window, what you can see are a whole bunch of different panels, each one of them labeled on the x-axis with lag one, lag two, lag three. And what these correlations are showing you is the autocorrelation in the time series. And of course, autocorrelation just means you're the self-correlation. So this is the correlation between each data point and with the other data points at some period of time in the past. And what you can see is that that correlation decays quite substantially over time. And that by far our strongest relationship is at that one month lag uh, phase. So that gives us a feel for the correlation structure that we see in our NDVI data. Now let's go look at what that might look like for our random data. So let's do a lag plot again. And this time we're going to give it our friend white noise. And we'll do lags equal 12 again. And we'll turn off that do line. Oops. Run. And so this is what I was talking about when we're talking about random draws having no relationship to each other, they're completely independent. And you see that in all of these graphs. And looking at these graphs actually make the ones uh, for NDVI look not so bad. So let's go look, it's like, there's still a structure in there that is, with the NDVI data that is completely lacking for the random data. This inherent structure in the data is one of the reasons why when we plotted NDVI as a time series, it looks really different um, and has, it seems to have much more coherence from time point to time point um, than you see in the, the random time series. This is a great data viz step, but it's not really enough for us to be able to interpret things more precisely. But there are methods for helping us to, to really hone in on what this pattern of autocorrelation is, and that can provide some help in interpreting what's going on.